Hello everyone, good morning. I hope you'll have had a cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is that have enough energy on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, with the, I, I hope you're all, you know, completely ready for the talk. So we have much interesting discussion that's going to be going on. Uh, and without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for the day, Rahul Venugopal. So Rahul Venugopal is a fourth year PhD scholar at the Center for Consciousness Studies, Nimhans, Bangalore. And his research revolves around understanding how we experience the world as it is, how to improve intelligence, memory, and similar questions. He relies on many statistical and signal processing tools to make sense out of the brain. He has worked in multiple research projects involving topics like brain computer interface, meditation, sleep cognition, well-being, et cetera. And just a snippet of what he shared with us, and you, for those who have read that chat might know, what he's going to talk about is more about the reflections on the various challenges he has faced while using R. Uh, many of us know how, how tedious it seems when you're a beginner to start with R. And then through the PhD journey, you, uh, we all come across many things and knowing, knowing this journey can help many of us here. So without further ado, I'll uh, hand over, pass the mic to Rahul. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Nita, for that uh, warm and kind introduction. So at the very onset, uh, let me thank uh, Aditi and uh, our mutual friend, uh, Mr. Abiram who connected us and uh, could make this happen. So I'm very grateful for the network, so to speak. So let me share my slide. Um, yeah. uh, is it visible? Could you please let me know? Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think power went off here. So maybe I'll turn off my uh, video to save some bandwidth there. Right. Uh, yeah. Sure. Right. Cool. So what I have in my mind is a very uh, informal and in, uh, interactive talk where uh, the goal is to reflect on how I started uh, with uh, learning R and my journey uh, uh, through the R path, right? So the whole idea is to uh, reflect upon certain points which I felt uh, was very important and which uh, will be common to many people who uh, start uh, with a programming journey. And unlike other programming languages, uh, R is a very uh, specific language, especially for uh, statistical computing, but it extended its powers, uh, especially in the last uh, five years or so, where we have uh, tons of packages coming from open source contribution and all, which are aimed at uh, very specific things and lots of uh, community support, right? So today, uh, I'll just walk you through a couple of uh, examples and events which uh, happened in my journey. So, and what I learned from that and, or what I wished I could have done it better, so on and so forth, right? So, yeah, this logo is taken from uh, Our Lady uh, Bangalore, uh, the Twitter page, uh, very artistic uh, logo. So, um, just give me a second. Uh, right, 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 yeah. So, a bit about myself. So, I, like, uh, bulk of the population in Bangalore, I started as a electronics and communication engineering. And after engineering, uh, the kind of default path was a software engineering job, even though my uh, major was not a core uh, a computer science specialty. But I was working for an MNC for one year, but somehow, I mean, I was not finding a job very motivating and all. So I thought, okay, I always loved uh, teaching and research. So part-time I used to work as a school teacher. And then uh, for I think a couple of years, I was uh, where I was contemplating about my career. I was uh, spending my time volunteering and uh, as a career coach and an aptitude trainer. So that's the first time I became aware of so many uh, hidden uh, things in learning and teaching. 
for example i think around um, in the year 2013 or so i was uh, working with a couple of ngos uh, whose aim was to get uh, people employed so these are the people who have just uh, class 11 class 12 level of proficiency that too they would have some of them didn't even clear the 12th exam and they know only their regional language and they were trying to get a job by attempting uh, some state specific exams so they were looking for some job opportunities as a loco pilot or some clerical positions right so most of these uh, exams the uh, job exams involved some kind of uh, aptitude questions and uh, which always had a pattern but the problem was these people were uh, uh, had no access to these uh, learning materials and it was primarily in english so it was very difficult for them to without any external help to prepare for these exams so that's where uh, i was of use uh, where i used to go through the pre uh, previous years materials and try to teach them so that's where i understood that many of the things as mentors or teachers or as learners we assume so many things we assume you they know this these are common sensical things but when you look at the other side as a learner when you are starting from scratch uh, what um, so many things your teachers or mentors assume uh, it's not at all obvious right so that was one major learning i had and i had lots of uh, stumbling blocks uh, from myself i mean how am i going to teach these people and i at uh, i mean i would be honest here i was extremely frustrated at uh, some point where i felt like i mean these people know nothing they want a job but they are not serious but a uh, couple of my mentors at that time they told see you are new to this it will take a uh, couple of days or weeks uh, to get used to the uh, understanding their problems right so think from their perspective so their goal is not to become enlightened with knowledge and all their primary thing is rahul Okay, lost him. Uh, can anyone else hear? Uh, no, I can't hear either. Hi, Rahul. Are you there? Let's just uh, give me another five five minutes. Can somebody check with uh, Rahul, please? Aditi? Uh, yes, I think it's the uh, yes. I can do that. Just a minute. Uh, sorry, I think I lost my connection. Glad you're back. Yeah. Glad you're back. Yeah. So was I gone for a long time, or it was just a no, minute? No, no, no. Or... Just uh, just a bit. Give it a stop. <laughs> sure, sure. Let me reshare my screen. Nita or Adi, can you uh, help me to share the screen? I think I've lost my co-host thing, so I'm yes, not able to. Yes, uh, do... I will do that right away. Yeah. One minute. Right. Yes, done. All right. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, slides are back. Yes. Oh, great! Great! great. Yeah. so there was that so after that uh, stint i decided to switch my career into neuroscience and at this point uh, all my training was in core engineering and i had to teach myself from scratch because in neuroscience there are so many terms there is anatomy physiology all those things so uh, many of the things i learned working as a teacher and as a mentor and a trainer many of those skills were transferable so i could relate to many of the things uh, which uh, i struggled and i could use uh, some of 
uh, those learnings to help me in navigating my new career. So that was uh, that's my background. And if you ask me how was my uh, journey in R, uh, it was more or less like this, right? So in this talk, what I plan to share is why was my journey so rough, and what are a couple of uh, learning examples and experiences, uh, which uh, I mean, just sharing them and what I learned from them will be useful for all of us. So, so let's uh, get started, right? So I think most of us uh, will uh, be able to relate to this situation where uh, generally they tell, okay, uh, programming is easy, right? So program is uh, very easy for people who know it, but it's very difficult for uh, somebody who is just new to programming or uh, people who have some basic experience and uh, working knowledge, but when they get stuck with bugs or something they can't figure out, and even after going through tons of documentation, stack overflow or whatever, uh, you are simply not able to figure out uh, what is a big, uh, what is a bug in there and you are stuck. And then somebody tells them, hey, programming is easy. And then like, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a very difficult scenario. So that's one thing I also experienced. So just to uh, make things a bit uh, concrete instead of abstract notions, uh, how many of you ride a scooter here? You can let me know in the uh, chat box. Mm, all right, one, what about others? I'm still learning. I, all right. Okay. Uh, so how many of you uh, can ride a scooter? That was the question. Yeah. Mm. Oh, good, right. So I think majority can. So, uh, all right, all right. So let me ask you this simple uh, question. So uh, you can let me know in the chat or you can speak up as well. It's a simple question. How do you start an automatic uh, start scooter? What's your answer? You can speak up or let me know in the chat box. It's a simple question. Right? Yeah. Just click the... press the start button. Yeah. In my case, I have to hold the clutch, clutch lever and press the start button. Uh, okay. So this particular scooter, no, this is an automatic uh, start oh, scooter. Okay. Okay. Okay, then right. I, I I've never driven an automatic scooter. Sorry, <laughs> I'm right, sorry. Right. Yeah, fine, I'm taking fine, my, fine. back my answer. <laughs> All right, fine. Yeah, so I think we got enough uh, samples to make an inference. So I mean, majority of us will mention that just click the start button or the press button, the uh, automatic uh, button, right? So that's what hap What was happening when my wife was trying to teach me scooter recently? And I pressed the button and nothing happened, right? So I was wondering what happened, right? Already I'm in a bit uh, panicky mode that, okay, I mean, whether I will fall, because she clearly told me that you should not put accelerator too much. You just start it and uh, do whatever. Just It's just a single button, right? But what she forgot to tell me was, you have to hold the brakes. Then only uh, it will start. So uh, being the researcher, uh, so I looked it up. So the whole idea is unless you press the brake, the circuit will not close and the ignition won't start, right? So for anybody who is used to riding a scooter and it's not rocket science, it's a simple thing. A good majority of the population, irrespective of their creed, caste, gender or whatever, they can ride a scooter, right? It's no big deal. You don't need uh, an engineering degree or a PhD degree to ride a scooter. But the uh, point is the instructions, no? Uh, we can't assume things. That's the whole point. So if you know how to ride a scooter, you already assume so many things, right? That uh, it's it's obvious for you. But for a person who is totally new to it, and it's not obvious at all, right? And then I went to YouTube and I started looking into so many YouTube channel videos where uh, they were uh, through online. I mean, because of the uh, pandemic uh, situation, so many YouTubers started making uh, this, uh, even swimming and uh, what is it? The uh, riding videos. And only in just one or two videos, I could find that people were giving instructions as if uh, we call it LEFI, right? Explain like I am five year old. So I could relate to these situations when I was learning as well, right? Don't assume things. So you can read, sorry for the language, you can read the colored notions. When you assume things, you make that out of you. 
right? And many times when uh, people give walkthrough of the code or in your tutorial session, many things are assumed. For example, currently you are in your working directory. So whatever uh, file you are loading, it is already available. You are starting from that. That many people assume. And many people assume that already you have installed all the libraries you need to do the analysis. But uh, if you are a beginner, I mean, how will they know what all libraries you need to install? And even some tutorials mention, okay, please install these libraries. And many people assume that, okay, uh, you would have done that. Again, naming conventions, then tidy format. Otherwise, the data will be in totally different format and you will wonder what's going wrong. And there are so many examples, right? So when I started uh, learning R, uh, this was a major stumbling block. So even though a couple of people were extremely knowledgeable in R, they are somewhere intermediate and close to say Hadley become level or whatever, but uh, they were never great mentors, right? So at that time when you are beginning, uh, I mean, when you make simple mistakes and when you are not able to move ahead, you uh, find it very frustrating. So that was one thing I thought I'll share. And second aspect was the so-called purists. Purist versus pragmatist. So purists are the people who believe that Everything should be made of the China, the uh, ceramics thing. You should never match any other junk type of uh, materials in the kitchen. Everything should be so perfect. Things should be aligned well. But uh, in terms of utility as a beginner, maybe you can reach this level or you can afford to be in that level when you are a expert programmer or whatever. But when you are a beginner or uh, many times, we have to sacrifice the so-called uh, pure approach for uh, practicality, right? So uh, that's uh, very important. So in this context, uh, many people, when I started learning, they told me, you learn everything in base R, right? If you want to make a plot, if you want to tidy up the data, you do it in base R. Why are you loading packages and polluting it? And you will never learn. That was a thing mentioned if you are going the tidy verse way. Right. And interestingly, a couple of the initial textbooks I was following, the uh, um, these books were released around 2011, 2012. They were following the base RV to deal with the data, data wrangling, uh, cleaning, tidying up and everything. But uh, uh, around, I mean, 2018 or 19 is where I started with R. So that time we had uh, tons of uh, tidyverse uh, tools available. But uh, people were like, okay, I mean, there was there were compatibility issues. So you are neither here, you are nor here, and you are stuck in a limbo. You can't move here or there, right? So I struggle with that. So people having strong opinions. And in programming world, it's quite, uh, I mean, uh, there, right? When people advance in their career, they will have uh, uh, preferences and all those things. Uh, was there a question or? I mean, please feel free to stop me and ask uh, whenever uh, you want to make a comment or, or, or any question, please feel free, right? Uh, uh, shall we continue? If yes, there are no... yes, yes. Oh, cool. Right. Yeah, so there was that, right? So, oh, I mean, we are neither here nor here and you are stuck, right? So some tools, so personally, I would say uh, these are tools, right? And it's quite uh, possible that it happens that we get attached with the tools, right? So it will be like us versus them. People get into, if you look into Reddit and uh, similar platforms, you can see people uh, fighting about the spaces, the indentation, this thing, that thing, MATLAB versus R versus Python. Programming wars are a real thing, right? So my take is uh, there is some value in having that war, but it is up to us uh, to really see if we want to be part of that war or just uh, get the be benefits from both the worlds. So that was the second point. So let me move to the next slide. Right. And then another aspect was when I started learning, bulk of my learning was happening through either textbooks or YouTube videos. So then very late, I think around 2020 or so, I came across the amazing communities which were existing in online world. For example, there is this community uh, with goes with the hashtag R stats, R for data science, then R ladies platform, and many of their uh, tutorials, GitHub pages. I mean, there are tons of things. Then 
another thing i came across was the tidy tuesday right i think it is hosted by thomas mock so what happens is every tuesday they will release a free data set and we can make visualizations out of it and people will share their visualization and most of the times they will share their code as well right how they created uh, those visualizations using uh, ggplot or i mean primarily using r that was a whole idea and a uh, couple of times i think uh, they already gave the cleaned up data sets so we don't have to worry too much about how to get the clean data out of it already the data was clean and we have to worry how do you so this was about weaving uh, data stories right so there is a huge difference between a plot versus visualization versus data story and i was very fascinated seeing all those things right and that's where i realized uh, instead of being a lone wolf you can always benefit from the community and people were really warm and these are the people who are at a really pro level even employees from our studio and people are doing really good and they were good mentors as well so they were sharing their code and uh, they were really helping out the people who are just newbies even very simple questions which anybody would have felt hey, just uh, read the document and you can figure it out but uh, they were good mentors so they never assumed things and they were happy to help out right because somewhere down the line they would also have struggled with a similar phase so if you have gone that route uh, then you will realize how people will struggle initially so that was another thing which really accelerated i would say uh, i was going maybe at 1x but it i could really accelerate myself five times with the community support and that was the time i started using uh, twitter most actively and i was uh, i mean generally following people bookmarking them still i was not very comfortable in uh, asking questions okay what will they think is it too silly a question and all those things and then i came across multiple talks especially from i think alison host was a previous speaker and i mean the kind of mindset they have right in freely sharing resources and they want everyone to be on board there is uh, i mean there is mentorship available across all levels so it's available for people who are just starting with r people who are working on very specific problems and uh, people who are writing uh, packages and so many things right so i really uh, benefited and i uh, felt okay at some point i should also contribute so till then i was at a consumer level where people will share their plots and instead of making my own contributions i used to replicate uh, those uh, plots and try to see if i could follow along all those things and so i think within an year or so i was uh, starting like this let me use a pointer <laughs> i started off like this but after a while i got exposed to tons of packages right so previously to get a summary of uh, large data sets with so many variables i was uh, going the base r way writing very long programs which are i mean working but uh, uh, so many bugs and it was uh, when i try to do it with another data set something or other thing will break and later i came across amazing packages which will help me to do things right so i heavily benefited from those things and i think after a year or so uh, i was feeling very comfortable with the entire ecosystem and the community and i used to bookmark and keep which people are good mentors right who are sharing their code who are asking and willing to help and with a single tweet even though i mean i could find so many so called uh, silly uh, questions and they were encouraging it and i used to keep track of those people and wanted to see how they end up after 6 months or so and i slowly noticed the trend that with uh, tidy tuesday submissions and later recently there was the 30 day challenge from cedric sherer who was a previous speaker and i feel so glad that from where i started uh, i am giving uh, a talk now so i feel very positive and i feel very humbled uh, for that right because it just uh, the community is uh, good will and they really want to help out people right so uh, that was some experiential part of things and now let me show you a couple of things where i worked and i also i mean instead of being a consumer i started contributing right so there was this uh, royal uh, belgium uh, society of zoology and uh, and interestingly i noted 
uh, amazing uh, ecologists are there who are sharing their code for example there is this uh, group called our i mean uh, coding club so they have tons of tutorials workshops and i think they do weekly or uh, biweekly sessions now you can look it up coding club i think i'll share maybe the link in the uh, that shared document which uh, aditi or diti share right so they have amazing tutorials which are extremely beginner friendly so and cedric shader and uh, yan holds so yan holds runs this website called data to this and r graph uh, gallery he also runs python graph gallery as well where uh, i think i'll come uh, that to the end of my talk so this was a data set which was shared so being ecologist this was a data set from ecology so every year and uh, number of uh, sea uh, creatures especially cetaceans so cetaceans are uh, for example porpoises dolphins whale all those uh, amazing creatures and many of these creatures were captured from ocean and were used for some circus show and many of them started breeding within captivity and after a point uh, there was government restrictions on uh catching these animals because of inhumane treatment to them and all so that was a data set right and now uh, as a, so after i think it was a three day workshop and at the end of the workshop all participants were encouraged to create a data visualization or a data story out of it and uh, i think uh, they had three prizes uh, which were uh, very amazing and generous right including attending their conference at belgium for free and uh, a good poster from our graph gallery so uh, our graph gallery and so on and so forth right so i was wondering i mean can i because till then i was a consumer of these things right so i had huge bookmarks where okay this plot was there that am visualization was there they did this and uh, only some of them i was able to replicate even though it was the same i was following the same code but i really didn't understand many of the things right so i thought okay let me give it a shot right so and i gave it a shot and uh, i think i got lucky and i uh, got the first prize in that so let me uh, show you the visualization what i made so this was a visualization i made right so i mean i really th thought through and i would say this is this plot i made is not my original contribution it's inspired from so many tidy tuesday or a uh, 30 day challenge similar contributions and i was just going through many of these to find uh, i mean uh, some creative ideas right so i thought i could use i mean color palette is not great so that was one critique comment i received but everything else was awesome so i thought i should have some color matching so that people when they read the text they will immediately know whatever is uh, colored captured will be in red color what uh, animals the count which was born will be green color so on and so forth and so i thought okay there should be color coding and things uh, should be simple and i watched couple of uh, documentaries i think around same time there was this netflix documentary called uh, octopus my teacher so if you haven't seen it look it up it's an amazing documentary right so again being a consciousness researcher i had this question running behind my mind that are whales conscious are dolphins uh, intelligent all those kind of things so uh, let me zoom in on my visualization so that i can just uh, walk you through the visualization so i thought i will have a circular plot but i knew that uh, in a circular plot no it is very difficult to gauge uh, uh, to make comparisons for example if so here you know that okay this bar is uh, uh, shorter than this bar but if you want to get a full view this is not a great uh, plot but if you just uh, do a simple bar plot uh, things you can directly compare y axis is straight and uh, everything is standing on a same line same baseline level so you can do a great comparison and you can make sense out of it but the problem is it was not uh, visually very appealing so i thought i will have numbers to bridge that issue so these numbers are the aggregate total so all the animals in 1955 for example which were captured which were born and rescued all together the number was 11 and within the 11 i wanted to just give a visual sense of the majority not exact count so if you just look at from say 1938 till uh, maybe 1988 you can infer that so much of animals were being captured and after 1988 uh, absolutely there were minimal capture and rest of the population of cetaceans uh, were either born in captivity or some of them were rescued 
So, I mean, that was the story which I wanted to tell. And I added a, a transparent image as well and some ocean blue or whatever. So, again, I agree that the color palette can improve uh, so much. Color palette is not so great, but I really loved the idea. But one thing was I wanted to highlight, for example, if you see the total count uh, in, in the year 1972, uh, that was a year where most number of uh, CNMLs were captured, right? And I think this was a data from just the US alone between 1938 and 2017. So I wanted to do some highlighting. So I tried, uh, sorry, I don't, I haven't put the intermediate plots. It was way horrible. And I went through at least some 20, 30 iterations to reach here. So I was wondering, I mean, I wanted to badly highlight this particular, uh, I mean, uh, uh, year. And I wanted to make red in color so that it gives some, I mean, our attention normally goes to this bright colors, right? So, uh, but how do you do it, right? So then I thought, uh, if it's convincing for you, and if it's serving the purpose, you can actually break the rules which are conventionally followed in the world of statistics or uh, data visualization stories. So I thought I will break uh, the axis uh, height and uh, still I will make it proportional, but I will let the bar bleed outside its normal contour. So I, again, I mean, uh, I had the idea, but I was not knowing how to implement that in R, right? Even though it's a simple thing, but it took lots of time for me to figure it out. But then I was glad that it came out well, right? Whenever you see the graph, uh, the year 1972 and its number is really obvious. And the color contrast also I liked. So the yellow and the red, right? So that was that. So then I told you, right? This was, I will not claim this was my original idea. It was inspired from so many previous presentations I tried to replicate from tidy Tuesday submissions. So primarily this was one plot which inspired me a lot. It was from uh, our previous speaker, Cedric Scherer. You should definitely follow him and look up all his uh, contributions which are available in tidy, I mean, GitHub. Uh, they're really amazing. So he is truly a wizard when it comes to these things. And he runs so many tutorials and he supports the community. It's really amazing. So this was the plot he generated. So it's about the carbon footprint index. So that's where I, I got the idea that you can have a image at the center and you can have legends around it. And I really didn't like these things touching it. You can see if there is a small gap. So I really like the very small, small aesthetics and the color palette and everything. And before that, I came across this, see, it was the same data set, how carbon intensive is our diet. And in the circular plot in the rim, uh, sorry, the image is not very clear. These are the countries. And for each country, what is a, a carbon uh, footprint coming from different types of diet? So only problem is there is no legend here for us to tell what is green, what is white, and what is red. I think it is available in another plot. And this particular plot, I couldn't replicate. This was, I think, one year back or so. And uh, I was like, I tried myself. I gave the data set to my senior. Both of us sat together and spent some couple of days. Uh, and it was not working out. Then after a couple of days, I found uh, Art Poon. He's a, a professor. And I have linked in the that document as well in the shared document, all the links, what I'm talking about. You can look it up from there. So he shared a basic, uh, it was the same plot was recreated using Bayesar. So I was like, maybe some package uh, inconsistencies or dependency problems. And I was juggling between uh, 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 Ubuntu Linux system at home and a Windows system at my work. So bulk of these things I do at home on Sundays and all. So all the Sundays used to be just uh, going through the visualizations or some statistical stuff and learning all this, right? So, uh, I tried to replicate it and one year, I, I mean, I was going back and forth uh, to this thing, uh, but no luck, right? So I was thinking maybe I will not be able to do it. But when this data with challenge came, uh, like Steve Jobs mentioned, right? Things, you will be able to connect the dots when you look back. You might, you will not be able to connect things then and there uh, to connect the dots to make a figure or whatever. But looking back, you can connect so many things, right? So whatever things, even though I was not contributing, Every plot I used to take, I used to go through the code, try to replicate it, try to make some tweaks. And I used to comment these portions of the code uh, very heavily so that I will know if you want to move this thing to the right, to the left. Sometimes it's not absolute values. It's some value between zero and hundred. So I was wondering is zero here or zero here. 
right? All those things. So I learned a lot, even though it's not very relevant. It's like, see, in real life, we never lift heavy weights or do push-ups or pull-ups. But in that process, you are training your muscle so that these learnings are transferable. So, and it requires lots of discipline as well, because every time it doesn't come up to a neat plot, it's very frustrating, right? So, and our lab does lots of work on meditation as well. So I felt I have picked up a couple of qualities by just uh, going through this phase of uh, frustration when I mean, making plots and all this stuff, right? So there is that. And later, after making this plot, I thought I should really work on the color palette. So this color palette is so-so. I will not tell it's great. It's okay, I feel, right? So then I thought, okay, let me, uh, I mean, for a short while, I think two years or so, I was uh, working as a sleep researcher as well in the same lab. So I thought, okay, I mean, uh, I had a couple of data lying around where each bar is coming from one subject. I think overall we had 130 subjects from a uh, pool from some of our previous studies. And I had of the total amount of uh, the time they sleep and in sleep uh, to just give a short uh, intro to this so that you can understand the plot better. So say of the total time we sleep, uh, sleep is divided into many phases. So called the light sleep, the deep sleep, the REM part of the sleep where most of the times we have dreams there. I mean, there are, we dream also in the non-REM phase as well, but majority of the dreaming happens in REM phase. So, and N2, N2 is kind of a sleep just before the deep sleep. And 50% of the time we spend in our uh, N2 sleep. So I didn't select a REM uh, sleep. I just took the non-REM sleep and it is again divided into N1, N2 and N3. And I just wanted to see uh, of the 130 participants, what are their sleep percentage uh, uh, percentages in these stages look like? Right. So I thought I should pick up. Uh, so in the previous plot, no, I think uh, either the they missed it or I missed it. There is no, there was no legend or it was subtle. It was somewhere there, I think. So I thought instead of giving an explicit legend, I will use same coloring idea. So N1, it is uh, this color. N2 is this and N3 is this. Right. And the order also matters. So we start from N1 stage where we get drowsy and we fall asleep. Then we progress to N2 and then we move to N3. So entry is kind of the deepest stage. So I thought I should arrange it in the same order so that entry is at a sink bottom level and everything is at the top level, right? And currently I ordered the data so that everything is sorted, but I can again sort the these circular bar plot in uh, ascending or descending order, starting with people having largest N2 stage and then the, the ID will get shuffled or I can just arranging arrange them based on the ID because the ID was given in such a way that ID number one to I think ID number 65, all of them were meditators and the other half, they were normal healthy controlled people. So if I wanted to make a visual comparison as a split half, half of them being meditators and half of them uh, being uh, controls. So everything is coded so that it's anonymized so that there is no bias or whatever. So I thought, uh, I mean, I have never seen this kind of plots being used in conventional research. So I would agree that bulk of the visualization, including me, what I make for my research, uh, they are mostly dull. They are not very aesthetic and all. Because by the time we finish data collection, analysis, doing the statistical inference, modeling, and everything, uh, I mean, we are fed up. So, right? And there is uh, not enough time or motivation left to make a good visual story out of it. And I think that is one reason bulk of the times our paper papers get rejected. There are so many other things as well. There is strong bias, and I mean, entire publication thing is. Uh, another story, so uh, I don't want to get into that, but it's very important, right? So I was like, okay, from our side, instead of going the pessimistic route, uh, what can I do to improve my scientific impact? So I felt, and recently many people were talking about these things, right? The kind of visualization we do, if we can share the code, if we can share the data, and if we can write a small web page uh, explaining about uh, what was the finding, what was the results, and maybe sometimes, you no, know, all the media, newspaper, they will do a story if already things are in digestible content. Otherwise, why should they come to a researcher and try to make a simple narrative story out of it and then publish it, right? So I felt uh, that's a natural extension to all these things. So when we do and spend lots of time doing all these things, you no, know, we also constantly think about how can we improve our research? What can I do better so that I can tell better visual stories, right? So this was a very neat plot, right? So it's right away there. You don't have to explain too much. So that, uh, for example, I have to present a 10-minute pitch. So I can use that 10 minutes 
uh, to uh, polish my other aspect of research, right? Uh, instead of spending time to explain what is this plot, what is x-axis, what is y-axis, all this, right? So that's what, with my journey overall, initially it was very frustrating. Slowly, without the community support, and all, I started learning. And since I'm learning a lot, right, I felt, okay, I know everything and all. But then when start, things started going south, I was not able to fix a bug. I couldn't understand what's happening. It was very frustrating for me. And then it was another uphill climb. And at some time point, I met, uh, I got in touch with so many people and it really opened up so many doors of uh, opportunity. And I knew that there is a ton more to know. What I know is only a drop in an ocean or even less, right? But having that knowledge was very reaffirming that, I mean, it's humbling as well, right? So, because otherwise, uh, I mean, I don't think uh, research, research scholars are confident. They all suffer from uh, that, uh, what is it? Oh, there's one syndrome, right? Uh, imposter syndrome and similar where because it's an occupational hazard we are trained to ask questions question everything the second guess the self-doubt everything it's an occupational hazard for research and i feel it it's we should uh, be able to uh, be comfortable with such things if you want to go uh, long in research and uh, so it's very important to know what we know and to know what we don't know so after joining the communities and getting exposed to the wizards in this field and mentors, uh, I realized that I every day I know less and less, meaning I am exposed to more things, but uh, it was very inspiring and humbling. So that my take was, okay, I can learn from them. There are so many people I can ask to all these things. I think at this time point, I realized that I never held myself back from asking questions from that time point. And even in my department as well, I mean, we are in, in lab also. I'm very lucky to be in this lab, which is uh, from, I mean, I'm from the Center for Consciousness Studies, where uh, uh, I really love my lab. So people are also very encouraging. And we constantly ask questions, we encourage people because I mean, none of us are experts. We are coming from different, different fields. I'm coming from a electronics background. There are people coming from medical background, dentistry, core physiology. For example, Suma, she's here and she's my colleague and in my lab. She's coming from a decade or two decades long uh, physiology teaching, core physiology background, right? So all of us actually share our expertise and our skill set so that together we can tackle this big problem of consciousness. So I think many of these things, you know, lots of coding, programming, I and mean, there are so many things. So being part of a community is very self-assuring because many a times, I, I think, I don't know whether you're aware of the statistics that the, uh, and I am also working at Nimans, which is one of the key places where mental health is of, uh, prime important that's a nodal center and in last two years there are lots of uh, mental health concerns which are being addressed so glad to see that so in phd students and scholars the incidence rate or prevalence of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders are at least five times <laughs> than uh, the normal community right so again i mentioned all these are occupational hazards so how do we shield when we can never be out of this because as long as you are in the field uh, stipend will never come on time, you apply for a grant, nothing will come through, and there is permanent worry about uh, not settling in life, you don't have a uh, decent salary, <laughs> I mean, there are tons of issues, right? So how do you get out of this? So I, uh, I personally, I heavily benefited from the community uh, interaction, where uh, sometimes you know that the other person is also suffering like you, and some of their experiences, right? Because all of us are passionate about what we are doing. So it's very rare to find a profession which is rewarding for you and where you can seek pleasure and joy from what you're doing, right? And it may not be always. You can always have other hobbies and all other contributions which will make you happy. So we are not mono-career people in this generation. At least people, I feel, I strongly believe whatever you do for career should not define you. We should have that uh, multi, uh, uh, what, multiple angles where we look ourselves from and we should not be too serious with ourselves. We should take things lightly. So when you pose some questions, no, especially online community, internet is a big place and it's a dangerous place as well. Some guy or somebody, some human will be there or a bot, who knows, who will tell you, I mean, you know nothing. You are, you have simply messed up some simple things. Even you don't know that and you are giving a talk in a platform, right? So then people will get scared and you will never ask questions. So, I mean, you should, that's why we have two years. You should just pass it through the other year and be, I mean, it should not affect you, right? So being part of a community really helped me because these are safe places, right? 
and especially if you go through say our ladies community guidelines on the it's a very warm community and i remember i think i was going through the previous talk where alison host adidhi or somebody was asking uh, uh, i mean how do you remember all these packages and all and she tells i don't remember i mean that was very warm to know right so even experts in the field uh, they are very strong in certain things and they constantly share and learn it's always give and take right and they are also humble people right imagine the contributions they are giving so they are not sitting in their ivory towers and delivering gyan uh, they want the community to come along right so now let's switch gears and even though r is a statistical software with so many packages it's really more than that so uh, again this was one scenario which happened to me so i was in the lab and we never had a web page ours is a government institution we obviously have a uh, i mean official page but uh, you know i mean things it's not very flashy and if you want to make something you want to have a page for yourself an online space for yourself or for the lab so i mean we were we came across this situation where we realized when we became center for consciousness studies uh, we don't have a web presence right so we were thinking okay we now we need a web, web website and i was i mean personally i've gone through at least some 10 options right from weebly wordpress jekyll uh, i mean the google sites and other sites i try to learn a little bit of html css and try to build a website from scratch some mongodb database i mean things were not working out right so it became a actual full time job for me to create a website so that was the time i came across uh, dan quintana's blog he is a researcher and he also contributes heavily to r and he posted uh, in one of his blogs you can create a website using r and markdown and uh, blockdown package within one hour so i was hooked oh one hour is good and uh, you can look up our website so it's 100% made using r studio and r using the blockdown package so our website address is ccswebin.com you can look it up and i think i have shared that link in uh the shared page as well and uh, it came out really well and what i really liked was see we have a full time job i mean whatever time we have we used to put it in research and i cannot expect somebody to spend a good amount of time when i leave the lab maintaining the website so unlike a company website or whatever an academia website or a research website or your personal website for that matter it should be very simple to maintain and sometimes what happens is uh, uh, down the line nowadays many websites which are private for example wordpress and all your content is there right what happens if more of wordpress is asking you 1000 dollars to move ahead all your content which you accumulated over all the years is lost right and we cannot afford to pay that money so that's where i was really interested in uh, github or some open source or git or uh, where the content is available as simple text files and we can do some statistics on it uh, on our own content as well where the data is available to scrap and it is very easy to deploy to take the entire thing down and just to bring up another website in very short time and people can make changes on the fly with uh, minimal time going into that so actually the dan quintana's blog and there, there are so many other resources in this lane where they actually did a screen recording and you have to click this you have to click that and through netlify and all how do you host it so we could get our website up and running and i was uh, pretty pleased uh, with the outcome you can look it up and uh, the hugo hugo is also amazing right so they claim they are the fastest way to deploy websites and i think it's true and has dynamic search there is a light and dark mode you can search and it's on the fly search it's dynamic search when you search on the fly it will update and i mean it's very nice so then i thought okay i will have a personal website as well but then i thought i will experiment with this currently it's in a broken state but <laughs> i think i'll get back to this maybe end of this year or so so that was that so thing is by this time no when this demand came up in the lab and initially we thought okay we will like uh, hire a external person but then that person was asking 50000 to build it and then uh, to maintain it something extra and i think it's uh, taxpayers money right so and or we have to pay from our pocket and it's not justified and obviously the question is being the engineer in the lab uh, it was hitting my ego as well right so being an engineer i mean you are not able to create a website so that thing i felt okay oh, i should do something about it and there is amazing community so i started tweeting how do you 
create a website and i uh, searched came across many people who are very generous in helping me out and i remember there were a couple of people i mean i still know only their handles i don't know their real name only right so they shared their template codes and they were very generous and they told you just ping me if you get stuck or all those things right so that was a nice experience again from the community so even though it's slightly detached i would say from the core stats or whatever but uh, these are transferable skills if you know something in one domain you can easily transfer that to another domain i think that is one reason nowadays the research is heavily interdisciplinary as well right so there was that and then after a point i was like oh everybody is making r packages i should also learn how to make r packages so only the drive was that nothing else and this happened after the website thing and uh, i told you know i was working as a sleep researcher for a very short time two years or so and a couple of things we write proprietary uh, we have to rely on proprietary uh, tools and all and they really don't tell us what's happening behind the hood so and compared to our uh, i mean i ran some preliminary analysis and for some reason it was not matching with uh, what is already published and all so i was wondering either i am going wrong that was the first uh, uh, option or there is something wrong with the proprietary stuff right so then i thought okay really to look under things you need to see the source code otherwise how do you know right so that's the point i thought okay i'll give it a try i'll try to implement uh, the same algorithm in base r because i tried it using uh, existing packages and dependencies were breaking and i think 20 days 3 weeks or so i was not making much progress so then i decided there was a coursera course i think it was offered by johns hopkins i think so uh, it is called i think creating an r package or building an r package something like that so there no i mean i think mentors were not available so all documents were okay okay but we have to walk the path so that time i was struggling struggling and i remember i was tweeting about my frustration nothing is working and every time it is not passing the build and uh, one of the final assignment required me to uh, pass the build using travis or uh, appware and all so meaning it should be uh, deployed it should work smooth in either windows or linux or whatever so that was the first time i became more sensitive and aware of the continuous uh deployment and maintenance and all those things and about unit testing how do you really make sure the code you write is doing the correct thing because the code can break when something unexpected happens and sometimes the errors can pass silently we will never know right so this is also behind the huge replication crisis which is faced in the scientific uh, uh world so during this point also i heavily benefited from the community support so there was this lady uh, christian bloom so she is a sleep researcher and she has written a package to calculate sleep cycles right so in the sleep as well we go through cycles so and she already i think it was awaiting cran ciran uh, validation and all but without uh, worrying much about anything she just shared the entire guidelines and couple of short notes she made she just uh, ping me in, i mean send a dm in twitter and ask me hey you want to learn this i have i also go went through some of these similar issues and uh, you can look up these documentation and i gave my email id and within an hour she sent me the entire thing right so uh, that was i mean that that's, that's the community support i was talking about so if you want to walk a very long path you should never walk alone and you should uh, try to get benefits from this community and at some point i'm sure all of us will be able to contribute back as well right so there was that and a uh, couple of things then i i used to keep track of i told you know right whenever i spot a good visualization i bookmark it and keep it and whenever i am free or doing nothing i'll just go through this and wonder about i mean can i do better visualizations and all so recently i don't know how many of you people were aware of it it's so i call this uh, usefulness or even there are talks in this topic it's called usefulness of useless uh, knowledge so many things we think uh, especially in research and all are you working in a problem which is really solving a problem and in basic science no maybe not so sometimes we'll be wondering whether ants have consciousness so if you ask me as a practical from a practical funding agency kind of thing uh, i mean what is the application of these things we are bombarded with these questions many a times what is the application so i strongly believe i mean whatever we do there should be some practical applications but uh, not always i would go with a 70 30 percentage we should spend 30 percent of our life and time just doing things for the heck of it or the fun of it 
and many of the times no wonderful and amazing innovations and ideas will come from those uh, useless stuff right for example here i was just going through multiple plots and i learned in trying to create a better visualization i learned couple of things and over time it accumulated so nowadays if i want to create something i already have the parts of it built elsewhere in my project so since i created it i know each part of it so i can just like a master chef i can just combine things and get uh, amazing things out of it or maybe decent things out of it right so what happened in 2021 was the price of the matchbox it doubled so it was previously 1 rupee and it became 2 rupee so if you see here no uh, i mean it's a very neat so these are called i think physical visualization as well cedric sherer had uh, one uh, theme shared in this lens where you do not use uh, software but you make visualization using uh, physical things right it can be lego or it can be using vegetables as well you can just uh, cut your potato or carrot in shape so that it will resemble a bar plot so something of that and it's fun actually so here what they did was they were using matchstick and i think the height of the matchstick to and and x axis is not linear actually so here it is 1950 to 1960 is 10 years then 1980 to 94 is not it's uniform scale so it has actually violated the cardinal rules of visualization but again i am not a purist some people will so if the my idea is if it really makes sense and if it can tell the story you want to convey without creating a bias or cheating the people uh, it's okay at least i go with that uh, philosophy so in this case uh, we know that okay with every year there is a 5 paise to 10 paise 10 to 15 so 15 to 25 all these things right but uh, it was not very intuitive for me so that i thought i'll make another visualization using the same visual thing which a match box so the whole idea is how many match boxes can we buy if we time time travel with the current 2 rupee so if it is current i can buy with 2 rupees only one match box but if i take same 2 rupee and i time travel to 1950 i can buy 40 match boxes so it's slightly more intuitive you will get a sense of purchasing power how much the money can buy all those things right and i thought uh, so here no intapixel they are also amazing group they have a twitter handle and all i think it's called atindia.in.pixels so i mean they are they are good people right so here there was no reason given why it happened so i thought i will add a text after 14 years the all india chambers of matches in shivakashi decided to change the match box price from 1 rupee to 2 rupee because of rising cost and inflation so you will learn some trivia and you will learn how to so here instead of a, a bar chart going up it's actually a bar chart if you think through it right so the height of the bar instead of that it is discrete match boxes and i have flipped the uh, axis right the coordinate uh, flipping has happened so that it's more readable right and it's uh, it's neat when you want to pack so many items flipping that is a great idea right and interestingly when i was doing this plots i was not able to put the rupee symbol inside it why because previously i was using another font in which even if you put the same unique code uh, it will go empty you will never be able to put a symbol with that particular font and it took me i think one week to figure it out so i think if you look up my github page i have documented these things and i was asking all the people in internet why it is happening so people told no unicode uh, unicode should work and even some of them send me uh, try to replicate just printing rupee symbol in their plot using simple gg plot and they were able to do it so again i was wondering how come they are able to do it i am not able to do it and then i asked them again so at this around this time no i got very comfortable with asking anybody in the world if i wanted to know something i really never bothered about what will they think of me my ego my image or whatever because for me what is important is learning and i can go to whatever extreme i want to learn that thing. so that also i learned because i saw many people so i used to keep track of these people right so i could see them reaching very good heights just because they were asking they were not afraid to ask and they never bothered about what the other person will think of it right so then i realized oh the issue was the font size otherwise i think i would have never figured out uh, that thing i thought okay for some reason something is going wrong so there was that and then recently i think one of my friend my batchmate he is also interested in uh, sustained living and all those things and he is working on uh, meditation saket uh, so he shared me this plot and it was i think shared by uh, this group from yale 
So they work on climate change communication, how to make create awareness in people. So they shared this plot and he was interested in, okay, can you make similar plots using R? So he asked me on a Sunday morning and I spent the entire day replicating the same plot. I wanted a ditto copy of the same thing. So I just, so this data is simple, right? It's a single column data. I mean, two column data where alarm, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, dismissive. These texts are there, categorical. Uh, and then you have these numbers. And you can simply plot a, what is it? Mm, pie chart or a circular plot or a bar plot, for example. But uh, this was aesthetic and you had logos here and highest belief in global warming. This was a scale on which people rated all these things, right? So I thought it would be a good opportunity to learn how to do these kind of plots. That's what I did. And in this process, no, I was not paying close attention. Initial ones I created, what happened was when you plot this like, uh, I mean, circular plot, it's a two-dimensional plot and you are plotting a single number, right? So actually the area should scale according to the number. So 26% and 28% uh, it should look slightly larger and area should match actually. If you calculate the area, this should be 28 units. This should be 26 units. And internally, you know, when we do this plots, R can also use, uh, by default it uses area only, but I messed up some parts of the, uh, the geom. And what I was doing wrong was I was scaling the radius instead of the area. So even though the plots look like this, the scaling, it became obvious between seven and 11. So initially when I was making plot, the seven and 11 looked uh, very large and it was not proportionally scaling, right? So I got more aware of it and I was trying to fix it. For some reason it was not happening. But then again, I started asking people, I'll show you those slides later. So, and I think in that frenzy, I even tagged Hadley Wickham and asking, hey, can you please help me, right? So, I mean, by this time I was like totally carefree and uh, I mean, we should not hold back ourselves asking questions, right? And personally I have benefited and I know so many people benefited. So that's what the community is for. And when you are at a level where you are mentoring, you should also be willing to help out people say 10 years before where you used to be, right? And it's very humbling. We learn a lot doing that process. So then after that, I started creating templates. So in my lab and in my department, uh, many of us will do correlation plots. So there will be one continuous variable in the x-axis, another continuous variable in the y-axis, and we have to fit a regression line and find the slope of it, which will be the r-value, and compare to the null distribution, find a p-value, and you have to create a 95% or 90% confidence interval around it, shade it, and give those intervals, right? And sometimes you want to write a small summary about it. And sometimes you need a uh, this thing, uh, a caption as well, right? So whether it's a PhD or a poster or whatever. So many people wanted to do the same thing. So instead of making plot for everyone, I thought, can I make a generalized plot? Uh, I mean, generalized plot template so that they can put in the data, select the variable, clean it. And this is a rug plot. For every point, you can see what is the X location and Y location. So you can instantly read from it, right? So that was the idea. So this was a recent hobby. You can find it in, there is a repository, which is a public repository called Wis Others in my GitHub. So again, you can find the link in the shared document. So I started making these things. So that's where I realized instead of hard coding and all, you can make very generalized things which are universally useful for so many people. So if you want to get people on board into a programming language, you show them something so that they can trust you and they will get a sense that they can benefit uh, from this entire exercise or learning. Otherwise, no, the general question is, especially if people are not coming from a programming first background, uh, why should I spend too much time breaking my head going through documentation, all this code, it's scary. So you should show them some carrots so that they don't mind chasing it, right? So I could do this and slowly people are showing interest, but it's a long journey. That's where again, communities can be of help, telling them that there is always a community to support when you need help, right? So this was another thing where one of my friend, uh, he wanted, so each, so this is a, a pre-post design where you measure, for example, stress or whatever, perceived stress in this case, in a pre-session and after some intervention, it can be a breathing exercise or whatever, yoga, meditation or whatever. And we, he wanted to see what will happen to that perceived stress value after an intervention for that subject. And overall, you have a box plot and you can see the red color thing, which is the overall mean. 
So when you look at this plot, the way visualization is made, you know the mean value before and after, and you will get to know overall there is an effect or not. And now as a sub question, you want to see, are there any subjects who really uh, decreased in their rating? So the scale is flipped actually. So if you see a larger rating, people had better stress control. So they perceived less stress and the other one is ultra, right? And uh, with this plot, no, it's right away obvious. So there are these two people who really didn't benefit from the intervention. Now you can go back and see uh, if you make an interactive plot using Plotly or any other library, you can hover around and see what is the subject ID. And now you can go back to your data and see what is really special about these two people. Are uh, these people uh, uh, have any other condition or their disease severity is so high? That's why they are not able to get any benefit at all. So this is a control group and this is a study group. So here, bulk of the people, I think, sorry, it's ULTA. So wherever you see the blue line, these are the people who perceived less stress after an intervention. And these are the people who didn't benefit from the intervention, right? Or there was no intervention, the control. Right? So the whole idea was to be able to create this visualization so that they can be become better and better researchers. So when in research, especially visualization is very important. So without going to any statistical inference, you see the data. And here also there are many glitches. As you can see, if you want to make comparison within, it's okay. If you have to compare this versus this, the y-axis is not the same. Here it is min and max, 25 and 15. Here it is eight and uh, some other value, right? So the whole uh, idea is uh, the scale should also be matched. So you have to pull the data, get the maximum value, get the minimum value, and use it to scale both the y-axis. So I think in my GitHub, I have fixed this issue when my friend pointed out to me and I could fix it. And I think that's what available in the GitHub page, right? So these are again, some template codes, which it can be anything, right? Which has a pre-post measure, right? So whether you are able to do more push-ups compared to uh, joining gym, there are so many things you can do with it. And later, so here, as you see, mean is written as English text. So for some other thing, I wanted to create this called curtain plots or waterfall plots. And as you can see, the dots, here dots are solid, right? There is no effect around it. But if you see my pointer, there is a halo around it, right? So as you can see here, there is a slight halo around it. So again, this is a trick I learned from Cedric Scherer's, there was this astronomer, astronaut plot. So where I think uh, it was GG effect or something, I can't recollect. Again, you can look up my GitHub page where I have mentioned what package I was using. And so that was one thing I learned from my previous plot. And again, using this consistent color coding so that you don't have to explicitly match what is what, right? And creating symbols instead of text. So even though these are very simple things, right? If you don't know, you will spend another 15, 20 minutes doing this. But I already knew this thing just because I was doing, trying to replicate what other people were uh, uh, replicating and they generously shared all these things, right? So we are approaching the final five minutes of the talk. And this is one of the early, I think, contributions. You can see it's not very neat. <laughs> so uh, this was uh, to show that whatever you see, you know, uh, uh, things are not obvious. For example, these are, this is coming from the package called data Saurus. And here there are so many, uh, it's two variables, x-axis and y-axis. And all these uh, variables, they have same correlation, they have same mean, they have same standard deviation, they have same variance. But you will never realize if you just do st descriptive statistics. Once you plot it in X and Y, do a scatter plot, you can you realize that all these things are totally different. And you see there's a dinosaur there. That's why this package is called uh, data Saurus. So actually, I think in one of the universities, uh, they shared this uh, data set, eight, how many? One, two, three, four, five, 10, 13. 13 data sets were shared to the students and they were able to rigorously go through the data set and then uh, come up with whatever they learned. So only a subset of the people actually plotted the data. Other, other set of them, what they did, they did a correlation between this, they ran regression model, simple uh, regression, and they did so many fancy, fancy things, but only a handful of them, they plotted the data, right? As you can see the regression lines, all of them are showing a negative uh, coding line, right? And it's dicto same. And even though, I mean, uh, patterns are totally different. So the whole point is, unless we have uh, uh, all these tools, visualization tools, which will help us to really see what is happening, right? 
And once you do the distribution plot, do a violin plot, you will be able to see what is happening. So in this process, I learned about this data source and uh, these issues are there. And I learned how to facet it and put a separate header and give some background and change the font size of each of these things separately. I mean, so many things I learned, right? So each visualization or whatever I do, I'm trying to learn a new thing. And I really don't know where will I use these things. But so far in my experience, somewhere it will click. So if I want to do something, I think, oh, I have already, I can do, I can borrow some parts of the code, which I already did. So that end of it, it becomes a very pleasant learning experience, right? And previously I mentioned, I am, I don't shy away from shouting out help. So this is the one I told you. So I uh, use the, see the wordings. Clearly the areas are not scaled by the variable. What am I missing? Calculated areas too, calculated areas too based on radius as per pixels. I think I did so much of Excel sheet computations and all to prove my point, why I was not able to figure it out so that anybody who is looking to the problem can see what I'm struggling with, right? So I think there was a list of documents I tagged with these posts. You can look it up. And then I asked Hadley Wickham, <laughs> could you help me, right? So, I mean, we should not shy away from asking. So somebody else saw that and uh, he just he just looked through it and figured out that exactly where I was going wrong. And he told me, hey, you might be using uh, wrong aesthetics uh, somewhere inside the geo. You should say, state it outside, right? And <laughs> that was the thing, right? So, and another time I was like, recently I was uh, running some statistical models and uh, I was using some tutorials, but I was not really getting a full intuitive control over uh, estimated marginal means and uh, contrast analysis, right? When we do lots of heavy duty statistical modeling. Um, and, uh, I mean, I was able to do it, but I felt there are there were so many holes in my learning. So I asked, okay, can you help me? And uh, believe me, I mean, so many people generously shared resources, which I never came across and going through them really helped me understanding and uh, the nuts and bolts of the entire package and how we compute it, right? Otherwise, long run, I would have made so many subtle, subtle, tiny mistakes and it will go unnoticed. So the goal is even though, and this is where the humbleness also comes into the picture, right? Because many a times the research is a repetitive procedure. You, It is very rare that we get it right in the first shot. So iteratively, you will get better and better. And we should get comfortable uh, doing things that way. Right? Because school days or any other uh, educational training, you submit one assignment and you get a mark for this. We are never taught to revise things and get better and better versions. But in, agri uh, in research, if you see, uh, we have to submit a journal manuscript, it will go through maybe three, four rounds of revision, it will get rejected again, we submit. So that's very frustrating, right? So, uh, I mean, I was talking about transferable skills, right? So many of the things I was doing, actually helped me cope up with the research journey. It is a tough journey, all of us, it's a tough journey for all of us, but many of these things I started, uh, uh, I mean, I started feeling good after doing these things. And when I was able to help people, uh, I was feeling happy, right? So even though some of these things, uh, I mean, rarely I use it in my own research, but I will be able to help a colleague out. So I derive my happiness from that. And this, I think this was another plot from a survey where, uh, each question, so this was about uh, breast uh, examination. Uh, this was done in a uh, school going population where breast cancer awareness and all that. So we wanted to see about awareness in the baseline level and after teaching them uh, what will happen. I mean, are they, are is their awareness getting better or not? So here we had tons of questions. Questionnaire. This is a simple questionnaire based study. So in a quick thing, I wanted to see of for this question, uh, doing uh, bre breast state examination is a waste. So how many people felt it is a waste of time and how many people felt it uh, really useful and all, right? So these are, uh, there is a package called Likert and these are Likert scales, right? Where you, uh, I mean, move a scale from one to 10 or one to five or whatever. And quickly you will get a percentage count for three levels. And again, you can tweak the response one, two, three, four. You can make it descriptive as well. And the whole idea is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We, I can quickly in a short and a neat manner see what is the overall response for all the 12 questions in the question. And I can we can get distributions as well. 
and I can compare this pre versus post. So all these things uh, were neat. So I think I am approaching the final slide and let's wrap it up in a minute. And this was another plot which has to do with correlation plot. Again, you can find the code uh, in the GitHub page. And uh, this was an easy stats package I was talking about. And there's a collection of so many packages and you can go through it. Their documentation is amazing. And tutorial is also really great for so many analysis. I think it will benefit irrespective of our area of work. And our graph gallery, which I was talking about. And finally, this is the final slide. Let me spend a minute. So here, uh, if you are not aware of the image, so when we lost our Vikram Moonlander, it was a engineer who was not a core scientist or anybody who was able to track this particular satellite. So this is very inspiring for me because uh, even though we are not at the top of our game or top in the field, still, if you are curious and if you are willing to learn from openly contributed resources, uh, we will be able to learn a lot and it will have an impact. So again, I will call this hobby advantage or usefulness of useless learning. I mean, useless uh, science or learning, whatever. Right? And down the lane, initially, you will not be able to figure out why, how to solve it. But uh, after a very long time, uh, things will uh, get connected and uh, wonder why you were ever worried because you can easily solve all the things, right? Yeah. So thank you. Let me wrap up with this. And I think if you are, if you are running good on time, I'm happy to take some uh, questions. So let me quickly see the uh, this thing as a well, chat box. Uh, which package did you use for the last two packages? So uh, that was Likert and psych package for creating that survey kind of things. And for the correlation one, it was good old uh, correlation plot itself. What I did was to get the axis and all colored thick, I played with the uh, axis uh, label parameters. So it was a highly customized plot. And I used ggtext to generate, uh, I want to group together the variables based on some themes. So I colored them accordingly, right? So it was good old plot, but lots of uh, customization, so to speak. You can find I have shared the code, right? So you can look it up from the GitHub uh, repository. And I have shared those things in the Google Doc as well. And please feel free. I can, I'm available in Twitter. So RHL Venkabal is the handle. You can just uh, shoot me a message or a tweet so that uh, whatever I know, I am happy to share. Right. So yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Rahul. That was a very good talk. And I think I I think I echo the point that you know asking help is the only way to learn more. So <laughs> I do the same thing every time. So right. and I don't shy away from any questions. I usually don't use Twitter because I think sometimes Twitter doesn't reach the people I want it to reach. Yeah, so yeah. I spam them on Slack. <laughs> Right, as many right, people right. as I know. So right, uh, right. thank you for that. And the slides were wonderful. Um, yeah, that's thank all. You. And I think bulk of the things, again, I think especially the illustrations are from Alison Host. So she is an amazing personality, right? All the illustrations. You can look up her uh, GitHub page where if you are a teacher, you can use, there are tons of amazing illustrations where you can teach about a categorical variable, so many things. And it's very intuitive, right? So I think I have shared the link there in the uh, page. And on I can update it as well. So, right. Thank you for that as well. And all the resources are in the collaborative notes. Rahul has graciously yeah. added them. And also, please add your email ID there so that I can send the collaborative notes, the video of this, yeah. and all. Right. And Aditi, I think I have shared, I have put uh, the slides in a PPT, PDF, in both formats in the GitHub uh, repo. And I think you'll be able to, Great. I mean, fork it and add it to the. Uh, uh, our ladies, uh, the guitar. Yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. And Any thanks for anybody? wonderful opportunity as well. Right. So, because I consider myself uh, still at the beginner level, trying to push myself to the intermediate level. So, I think I don't think this opportunity would have come if I shied away from asking things and uh, getting in touch with people who really care about the community. For example, Abina, Abiram is the one who connected me to this and he runs. Uh, a Python community in Bangalore, and he is doing amazing things. So it's very important to get connected to people as well. So thank you, thank you, Aditi, for that. Uh, in case anybody has questions, if not in the chat box, maybe you can unmute yourself and speak up. I can see Rashmi's hand up. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you. This is uh, the first talk that I've attended on R. And thanks a lot. Uh, when people are so humble and when they tell that they have learned through asking, it's like it, it gives a hope that, okay, I will also be there. So I'm a right. social scientist. Uh, more, mm -hmm. I work on the political ecology of rangeland conservation. And mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes social scientists are thought to just write stories, I thought I will also do the vegetation analysis and show that yeah. what I'm saying, that people are saying, it's actually happening on ground. And that's how I got right. into vegetation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been a journey in last one year when I'm trying to understand or I mean, three years that I tried to learn, huh? but yeah, it happened through a Cambridge workshop, which was only for ladies. Mm -hmm. And it was really fantastic. So my, but so thank you again for that. Uh, my question is sometimes I feel that there's a question, but I don't mm -hmm. have the right vocabulary to ask that question because I'm right. not from the same background. So I'm just exactly. struggling a lot. So how right. can you, help? I mean, how can I, I find the right vocabulary Mm. That I want to do something else, but I write something else, which is not the right not word for doing that. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. For example, uh, uh, the that data source uh, slide I showed you, right? So mm. I wanted to do, do that kind of plot, and I never knew that it's called faceting, right? So if you look in the ggplot thing, it's called facet grid and facet wrap, right? So I asked people like, how can I, uh, uh, how can I plot? so many images in a single image or something. So then somebody told me, hey, you can use patchwork for that, right? So patchwork does, I mean, exactly the same thing, but it's different from face setting, right? It does face setting from multiple things, but what I have is a single data set and it will have, uh, say, two variables and then I need all the combinations of the plot. So, I mean, I also struggle with uh, what you were asking, but over the time I realized, so what I did was I did the reverse way. So I found a plot uh, through Tidy Tuesday contributions by just searching in Twitter or Google. And I realized, oh, this is a plot I need to get. And then I looked up the code and went through the code and so oh, this is called face set. Okay. Right? So I keep a diary online so that I note down each and everything. So it's like you start hitting the rock, nothing happens for one year, then suddenly it will break around second year or something. So I think it just keep trying and ask. So that's where I think when you ask people, no, I mean, in a community where we can slightly ask and when you mentioned this, I could immediately relate and tell that it is faceting what you're looking for. So, and this, I think it's still, I mean, our AI engines are yet to reach a level where they can get this abstraction from us. So until then, I think only community can help. Right? So again, feel free to just ask random people. And initially, I think I have asked at least some uh, 100 people and only one or two people replied in Twitter. So I was like, okay, I mean, I mean, so it was really frustrating, but slowly things happened. I kept asking so that, and sometimes, you know, what I used to go is, even though I find uh, some query from 2016 or 17 in Twitter and nobody would have answered it. Now, if I find something, I still answer to it. So it may not be for that person, but if somebody else see that, uh, it will benefit. So <laughs> where is that? True, true, Rahul. And I have one more question to the organizers. So if I have, so yeah, I think I have done, half, I'm halfway that there's a graph that I've found and it's just one graph which somebody has made and I want to make similar graph for my work. Uh, this is for the organizer, where should I send that picture, any email, any any like uh, group email that I can, I can email to or ask. I'm also new to the group and it's the first talk that I'm attending. So please help. Uh, so, um, we don't have an active Slack community as of now, but there's a whole uh, thing for, called Asia R, where you can post all your questions. And there's similarly another platform, which is called R4DS. Anybody can join and you can ask any question there. So just the previous question I'm adding to what Rahul said, even now, I don't know the right question to ask. So I Google for like half an hour, one hour, okay. and then I understand, oh, I have to use in or, or, or if for such questions. So even that, I think it comes over time and finally then you understand, okay, I just wanted this and I reached that. And even I keep a track of what uh, I Googled and how I got to this and what solved my issue. It's just a note to a future self. So, uh, and you can definitely ask questions in Asia R, R4DS, and there is also R Ladies Community Slack where people answer your questions. So yeah, I, uh, we can uh, do one thing on our Twitter uh, handle. We can up, 
upload a few resources for these places just to join the Slack community and uh, take it forward from there. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think there is, there are, I can't recollect now, there are a couple of uh, GitHub pages where it's a regularly updated uh, readme page where they keep adding resources and it's, uh, I think uh, now some organizing is happening as in putting them into categories, which is beneficial for psychologists, ecologists, or generic plotting, statistics, uh, Bayesian learning, machine learning. I mean, I think there are things. So maybe we can eventually add it to a single shared sheet like this. Uh, contributor page, Google Doc, something of that kind. Huh? Right, right, right. Thank you, Rahul. Um, any yeah. more questions or we can wrap up? I have one more question. I'm really sorry that I'm asking so many questions just because R is very new thing for me and I'm trying to learn a lot. Like starting from basic making dendrograms, that's what that's where I am right now. So uh, it, uh, and also about the circular plot that you had made. What what was the um, um, tool that you used for that? Just like you uh, you used like that for the recent one. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Could you please repeat it? I missed it. Sorry. Yes, sir. So I joined a little late. So I was wondering. Uh -huh. There were a lot of circular plots when I joined. And what uh -huh. was the tool that you used for that, the package? So all our uh, ggplot things, nothing extra. So it's just highly customized ones, right? And I think okay. I use ggtext quite a bit to get those circular ones. And uh, it's good old uh, polar plot, actually. So, but what I did was, and all, I manually tweaked. And I, I think I have put it in my comments that if you want to move it up, zoom it, zoom in. And you have to put something in the inside circle. How do you put it? Because certain things, no, uh, we expect it to weigh in certain ways, but it doesn't work that way, right? So certain things are still, I would say, I don't have 100% confidence, but with enough uh, tweaking, I can get it out. So you can find the code in the GitHub page that save citations repo. So everything I try to put it in public uh, if I have fixed the bugs to some extent. So there are still so many pending repositories where uh, there are some bugs which I am yet to put it. So I think with some polishing, I will start releasing it so that it's not too off from what it is. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for the insightful talk, Rahul. I enjoyed it. it it's so thank good you. that it's interactive and we are just adding to the already amazing R community. I think it's the support of community that, that takes us where we want to be. Thank you so thank much you. for contributing to that. And thank you, uh, thank Vishal, you for the opportunity did, as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Rahul. And Vishal, I did see your messages on uh, the chat. We'll we'll reach out to you for further collaboration if you are free to give a talk uh, or anything like that. Uh, thank you, Vishal, for sharing your info. Thank you all, all for right, attending. Listen. It was a great talk. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.